Love it. So before we begin, I am going to start uh, by sharing a quick land acknowledgement. So as a settler on this land and on behalf of Needs, I would like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are calling in from today. Our so-called Canada is built upon the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. These unceded and unsurrendered lands were taken through violent, non-consensual means, and colonial violence persists in our society today. We stand in solidarity with Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island as they fight for their rights, representation, and recognition. With many of us being settlers on this land, it is crucial that we recognize our positions within oppressive structures and our roles and responsibilities towards reconciliation. Uh, land acknowledgements like this are only a very, very small part of the lifelong individual and constantly evolving journey we must all take as we strive to improve our relationships between nations and improve our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. So to learn more about the land you are on, and I highly recommend this, a link to native-land.ca will be posted in the chat box. All right, so with that, I am going to kick off the event. I'm still talking, I'm sorry in advance. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today as we welcome back Elizabeth Moeller and Lisa Kelly for their presentation, Mentorship Works. Uh, today we're discussing the benefits of mentorship, how to find a good mentor, uh, mentor mentee guidelines and more. So uh, quick disclaimer and support and promotion. Uh, this event is a feature of our Virtual Access for All program, which is a three-year education and advocacy project generously supported by Employment and Social Development Canada that addresses the transition into post-secondary school and ongoing barriers for students with disabilities. I am still going, a bit about our speakers. So Lisa Kelly is a program manager at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce's Discoverability Network, where she created the program's content and delivers training to businesses, employment service providers, and persons with disabilities. Lisa teaches professional practice courses at Humber College, regularly presents at Connexus, and has delivered disability-related training to employers, including RBC, Scotiabank, CBC, the federal government, the list keeps going. Uh, past workplaces include Sensibility, the Ontario Disability Employment Network, and Rehabilitation Network Canada. Lisa is also a registered vocational practitioner and rehabilitation professional and is an alumni of both George Brown and McMaster University. One down, one to go. Elizabeth Moeller is a PhD student at Western University School of Occupational Science, cross-appointed in disability studies, where she studies the impact direct funding for self-managed attendance services has on occupational performance and engagement of persons with disabilities. Elizabeth is also needs research consultant where she leads the virtual access for all projects state of the school reports, quarterly reports on accessibility and accommodations at post-secondary institutions across Canada. Further, uh, Elizabeth sits on the Education Standards Committee for the Ontario government and is an inclusive hiring project coordinator for Ryerson Magnet. Elizabeth is also an experienced presenter, keynote speaker, lecturer, and published writer. And with that, I'll hand it over to you too. Well, we've got to cut down on those bios, Elizabeth. Yes, they're very long. So we don't need to probably, we can, we can flip through the today's host slide because you probably yeah. now know all about us. Absolutely. And everybody should be seeing our slides right now. So I'm Lisa. That's the voice you're hearing. I am a older white woman with gray hair, no glasses, who likes to smile. I'm wearing a blue shirt. Elizabeth, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you. So I'm Elizabeth Muller, PhD candidate, and I am in a mauve lilac -y top. I have glasses. I have a pair of headset on, headphones on. I guess I look like a bit of a DJ and earrings. And I have two degrees behind me um, on my wall. So that's just a little bit of a visual description. Shall we pop to the agenda? Yes, absolutely. So we're here today to talk about mentoring. And I thought what we'd do is we'd talk about, Elizabeth, if it's all right with you, what is a mentor? The qualities of a good mentor, spend some time talking about how to find one and keep one, and some guidelines for success. How does that sound? 
That sounds fantastic. And we welcome and we encourage participation. So please throw things in the chat, ask questions, raise your virtual or your physical hand, wave at us, um, jump up and down, whatever you want to do. We love participation. That's so true. Um, so first of all, Elizabeth, I'm going to throw this to you because you are definitely more in the know on this than I am. Um, what is a mentor? So a mentor is first and foremost, somebody that provides you with the tools and guidance and feedback that you need to thrive in your career. A mentor is not a coach. A mentor is not a counselor but also somebody that can provide you with honest and constructive and timely feedback. Perfect, so that, you know, I, I know we have up in the slide that it says they may share similar experiences, but they don't have to, right? We could look for someone in our field who has far more experience than us, and that could be useful. But we could also have somebody with a similar disability and that isn't in our field, and that could be helpful. So. I think it encompasses an awful lot here. Um, it's it's kind of not, it's not like it's defined clearly. So you have some room to play with this and find somebody um, who can help you with your particular goals. So and maybe it, it might be interesting to have people throw in the chat what a mentor is to them, just so we can get some ideas. Maybe there's things we haven't even thought of in this presentation. Absolutely. So while we're doing that, feel free to put them in. Um, how, you know, mentors can help. Well, and this is a big one for me, they can be knowledge and opportunity um, centers. So insights, context, and experiences. So Carly put into the chat that mentors have been bosses and teachers. Yeah, because they do have more knowledge than us. When we start a job, we're not expected to have the same knowledge base. We might have you know, even more educational experience, but we, we don't necessarily know the insights of how that's applied in a workplace. They can help you get unstuck. Maybe you just don't know how to move forward in your career. Um, maybe, you know, you're not sure why uh, you're not getting invitations to speak or invitations to job, um, you know, interviews or opportunities to be promoted. So they can sometimes provide some insight on that. They can definitely help you expand your professional network. As Elizabeth mentioned, they're going to share guidance, motivation, and sometimes emotional support, though we can't expect you know, that from everybody or, or to the degree that we might expect it. So we want to clarify our goals and, of course, assist with career um, exploration, goal setting, and to identify resources. Now we've got some things in the chat. Elizabeth, you want to go through them or would you like yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. So Alan's been, been um, kind enough to put in a really important point around multiple mentors. So you could have a technical mentor, for an example, and we're going to get into that. You can have mentors with a disability, without a disability. I love this idea about exchange of experiences. So it's about exchanging reciprocal relationships. That's really beautiful. And as well, teaching you things that they wish they had known. So some really great insights. We're going to have to use these to update our deck because these are really important I think. Elizabeth, what's one thing you wish you had known when you started? I think one thing I wish I had known when I started is the importance of feedback and that feedback is a gift. It can be hard to hear and sometimes we don't like to hear it but being able to give feedback puts the person giving it in a vulnerable position and it's it's a gift because they don't have to be honest and they're choosing to be honest so as long as it's done respectfully trying to really take that feedback as a gift and anybody who's in graduate school knows how often you get feedback so that's one thing i wish i'd known when i started out what about you lisa so for me it has more it's more related to my disability so i chose to wait until i was 50 to disclose um, in the workplace and I wish that I had. You just muted yourself, Lisa. Sorry about that. Yeah, so mine has more to do with my disability. So I wish I waited till I was 50 years old to disclose that I had a disability. And I think my disability was affecting my workplace performance. And nobody told me that. And I look back now and I think I could have been far happier because I think for me, it was a, an issue of thriving and feeling included. I was able to do the job 
but it was kind of a concealment for me. Um, so I really wish that somebody had said, you know, is there um, something we can do to make it more comfortable? And that might have just helped me to disclose and be more honest about it. And so I really wish I had known more about disclosure, accommodations, and how to speak about that in a positive way. You may hear my cat meowing in the background. Oh, well, that's what cats are for. So there are qualities of a good mentor. And ideally, your mentors that you pick would have all of these features. And we're going to break down and talk about it. But some qualities might be, a, you know, willing to be an advocate. And we'll talk about what that means. Willing to share, obviously. Value you as a person. Um, interacts with mutual trust and respect listens with empathy, and offers clear and honest dialogue. And that for me was the one that I, I, you know, I think would sum up what I wish that I had had in the workplace and that I had known about. Does anybody think there's any other qualities that not covered? Again, if you want to put it in the chat or unmute, maybe we've missed something that you think. Um, you know, and these are qualities, so we're not talking about knowledge base, just some of the things you might look for in a mentor. I think one thing that I didn't, I think one thing I didn't see on that slide, but I think is really important to add is an ability to maintain confidentiality. Mm. Um, that's really important because sometimes we share things with our mentors that perhaps we don't, we're not ready to share, including disclosure, right? We might disclose to our mentor about a disability, but maybe we're not ready to have that shared more publicly. And so I think that ability to be very sensitive with information is really important. Yeah, I put that under the mutual trust and respect icon, but I think you're right. Anne says, my interpretation of mentors mirrors what you've described, but I also feel it's about feedback and learning how to receive it, but also be able to give it when you're asked. I think that's very true mm, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Giving and receiving feedback is so important. And a great book that Lisa and I both love is Radical Candor by Kim Scott. And uh, we'll certainly send out that link after if folks are interested, but it's really important. Absolutely. So the first um, quality that we have listed that we're going to tackle is a willingness to be an advocate. Elizabeth, tell me what that means, what that looks like. Yeah, so it's it's really using their their social capital, or you could just say their their relationships, their networks, to get you access to opportunities, to interviews, to networking events. Now, not every mentor is going to a be able to do this, or b be willing to do this. But for ha perhaps, uh, for example, I'm really interested in public speaking and developing that skill. Uh, I might ask a mentor who has connections in that field, hey, would you be able to introduce me to somebody who's looking for a guest speaker? Or could you listen to me practice? And then could you, based on what I've talked about, make some recommendations as to where I might start looking? So those can be warm introductions where you actually do a handoff over email, or perhaps the mentor just gives you uh, leads that you can follow up on. But again, that's going to depend on um, the, the social capital or the relationships that your mentor has. And the relationships are coming comfortable to sort of share and that'll depend on where they are in their career um, and how well they know you because they have to trust you as well. And not every mentor is an advocate and mm -hmm. it can be helpful to have this kind of mentor in your corner and again that's just going to depend on their comfort level, how well they know you, how well they trust you and how well you've demonstrated your abilities and capabilities. And I think Lisa Al Allen has put a note in the chat. Do you want to read that? Absolutely. So Alan said one note to make is while well, having all these qualities are great. Mentors are also learning and growing. So it's also important to give them leeway to allow them to grow and try different things. And I absolutely think that's true. Yes. It's going to be very rare to find all of these qualities in someone. Use them as guidelines. The other thing is you can ask for introductions or, um, you know, opportunities to someone who is not a mentor. It's just um, a great uh, you know, practice whenever you're networking. So you don't need to have a formal mentorship relationship to ask somebody for an introduction, to ask somebody for an opportunity. That, and I you think... Know, 
I think advocacy too, you know, we might think of it as a sort of a very um, structured thing, but advocacy can be something as simple as looking over your resume or passing along a job opportunity. I have people all the time that share things with me on LinkedIn. And that is in a sense, a sort of adv advocacy, because what they're really telling me is I believe in you, I think you can do this. And they're pushing me forward. So sometimes I think, you know, especially in the disability community, we think of advocacy as this very structured thing, somebody's going um, to help you perhaps pursue something that hasn't been made accessible and they're giving you some resources or some tips, but advocacy can be softer than that, I think, too. Sorry, I was looking at my uh, screen. So I know we're getting a bit of an echo. Um, I apologize for that. That's partially due to the fact that we, um, the tech, and the way the system's set up and some of the assistive devices being used. So I apologize and I will try to um, fix that on our downtime, but not sure that we'll be able to resolve it completely. The second thing a mentor needs to do is be willing to share. So mentors should have expertise. That's really, really important. So mentors are different than friends. Friends may provide us with support and ideas but mentors should have an expertise you're looking for. It could be on anything. It could be the job field. It could be skills. It could be about your disability. It could be hard skills, soft skills, educational qualifications, but they should have something that you're looking for. This isn't uh, just let's get together and chat kind of thing. There should be an, an exchange. And, you know, Alan mentioned this, but, and good mentors want to benefit from their hired one wisdom, but they respect your individuality. So they're looking to get something back. They're looking to hear your feedback and improve as well. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to add anything else to that? I don't think so. No, I think you've, I think you've captured it well. I think, you know, that it's a challenge to kind of respect your individuality and, and maybe even your brand, but also give you that feedback if perhaps that individuality might be getting in the way of you obtaining some of those professional development opportunities that we talked about. So I think it's a really tricky balance for, for a mentor and a mentee to sort of um, walk that line between respecting e each other's individuality, but then being able to give that honest feedback as well. It is, and that's what makes communication in general difficult, don't you think? I mean, I, I think this applies not just to mentors, but to anybody. It's why we get caught up when we're communicating with people and we have to be able to not only share, but to listen and move back and forth on, you know, uh, dialogue to move forward. Tell me and about yeah. Alan, I love what you've said here in the chat, you you know, because that's so important. Being able to come to meetings prepared with questions to ask your mentors um, shows that you you value their time and that you've thought through um, what you're going to speak about. So for sure, that's really important. Thank you for sharing that. Actually ties in so well to this next point, value the mentee as a person, because mentoring is an investment of time and energy, yours, but also the mentor's. So Elizabeth, what are some other qualities that can demonstrate that the mentor values you as a person? So there's a couple of things. Doesn't expect immediate change and is persistence. Finds genuine fulfillment in helping you. So it's not, a, it doesn't seem like a chore or a task, but they really want to do it. Cares about maintaining and growing a professional relationship. So this is, like Lisa said, isn't a friend, although it could be, but really values you and sees you as a professional. Maintains confidentiality. We talked about that earlier, but that's so important, especially as I mentioned with the example of disclosing. Um, really important. Supports your mental health and well being. And that might mean taking a break. That might mean actually saying, you know, I'm not able to look for work right now. I'm not in a good place and I need to, to do some self-care or I need to take a break from school. Um, so really being able to respect that and value that, I think it's really important. And it's not something that we talk enough about, but self-care is such an important part of job search and of being a student. And frankly, even, even a big part of being um, in the workforce. So that's really important for mentors to value as well. Actually, I'm gonna do a little support for our honest conversations. Every Thursday at one o'clock, Discoverability hosts a series of honest conversations and Elizabeth and I came up with that idea. So it's, you know, really getting down to beyond the platitudes and the things everybody else tells you to have tough discussions about tough, tough topics. And in May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month, we're going to be talking about tools and strategies to support your mental health. 
with the CMHA Durham, the Canadian Mental Health Association out of Durham. And we're also going to be having Dr. Linda Shaw on, and she'll be talking, she's a neuroscientist from Britain, and she'll be talking about managing or channeling or preventing anger in the workplace. And I know that certainly for me to do with my disability, Elizabeth, sometimes I get very frustrated. Elizabeth knows because I often call her with that. So I um, encourage you all to check those out because I think this is a piece that isn't talked about a lot and is very important. Mutual trust and respect. So select someone you respect in the field and respect for you is gonna look different than the person beside you or who shares your disability. Again, somebody you respect, that you can trust that you're getting very good uh, guidance. So go back to my own personal experience. When I first, you know, uh, a lot of the jobs that I've worked in, even as recently as 10 years ago, I was told don't share your disability. Don't talk about it. And that can be very um, self-harming and lead to a lot of feelings of imposter syndrome, feelings of, um, you know, not being your authentic self. So again, finding somebody who has a disability to be a mentor might be different than your field or ideally would be both those things. Tailors their mentoring style and content to your needs, goals, and learning styles. So, uh, you know, I prefer honest conversations, just being really blunt and straightforward. But somebody else might want some time to ease into discussions. You might, you know, prefer to have your feedback in a written form. You might learn better by reviewing things on your own before or after a meeting. So our mentor, while they have their own styles, should be respectful of your style and accommodate that. I think it's yeah. So sorry, I think it's Elizabeth. also really that's okay. Um, I think it's really important to find somebody that interacts in person and online respectfully, and that's really important. So you can look at how people are posting on LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, you can search people. That's because that's a reflection of you, right? There's actually a saying that says you are a reflection of your five closest friends. So your mentor is not necessarily one of your five closest friends, but you're a reflection of that person if you're interacting with them. So you really want to make sure that they're posting things. And it's fine to post something that says, I disagree um, and, you know, offers constructive feedback. But if somebody's posting things online that are outing people in an unpleasant way, um, or really sort of antagonistic, that might not be somebody you want to be associated with. So definitely do your homework there. In this age of social media, that's really easy to do. Um, and avoid mentors that offer unconstructive comments or criticism. So constructive feedback is not the same as criticism. Constructive feedback helps you grow, helps you learn, helps you develop. It gives you um, a starting point and a place to finish. So, you know, if I was offering constructive feedback to a student, for example, I might say, I really like that you've chosen a topic that's clearly related to our course. I'm noticing that throughout you haven't used the proper citation style. Here are some examples of where that hasn't been done and here's how to fix it. Critical would just be, this, is a, this isn't a great paper. I don't love this paper. So there is a difference and it's important that your mentors are respectful and, and, um, and that you understand as a mentee and maybe even a possible mentor what the difference is too. And it's easy um, to, um, to, to kind of mix them up, which is why I really like to, to spell out that they are different. Absolutely. And to piggyback even another thing, we want somebody who's, you're right, not unconstructive and says, you know, this is a mess. But we also want someone who says more than fix it. Right? Because that's not helpful. It's not unconstructive, but it's also kind of useless because if we knew how to fix it, we, we would have done that in the first place. So that's back to that someone you respect in the field who is willing to share meaningful information with you. They should listen with empathy. So that means listen carefully, attentive listening, right? They share the air. They let you, that's a saying, it's in quotations, air quotes. Um, so it literally means that you allow them to have a voice in the conversation, um, that you don't spend all your time talking, that you're asking for other people's opinions. And I think this one's really important. They ask or offer comments instead of telling you what to do. Right? Because we don't need someone to tell us what to do. We're perfectly capable of doing that ourselves, but we might want somebody to offer us suggestions or different perspectives 
of how to do something. And I like I like what Alan says here in the chat about mm -hmm. telling your mentor how you want to communicate. I think that's really important. Is it in writing? Is it on Zoom? Um, in person, although we're still not doing a whole lot of that. And I really like the piece about, you know, asking questions, uh, probing questions rather than giving advice. Um, there's a, a really kind of funny saying that says, don't should on me. Uh, so don't tell people what they should do. You don't know that they haven't tried it. You don't know why they're not doing it, but ask questions like, what is the barrier? So sometimes uh, a student will come to me in my role um, and say, I, I, you know, I can't register for courses or I, I can't do research. And I'll say, well, what's the barrier? Talk me through what's going on. And once we've identified some of those barriers, then you can ask those probing questions. Have you tried contacting library services or have you have you worked with accessible learning services or have you? Um, and then when, when you get those set of probing questions, you can follow up and together make a plan, which is a lot more helpful than just saying, well, you should just go to accessible learning and they'll sort it out. Um, so I'm using examples sort of from my own experience being a teaching assistant because that's where I do the bulk of my mentoring, but it could have it could apply to anything. Absolutely. And, you know, um, we had a webinar with Dr. Sean a few weeks ago, and she said the number one thing people want in the workplace is to feel valued and respected. So that's really important, this final point. So I'm going to respect your values and inputs. And if they're new to this, as Alan has pointed out, give them input. What would be more helpful for you, for them, you know, and for you? Because it's going to make them a better mentor and it's going to get you what you need in order to thrive. Honest and direct dialogue. Elizabeth, do you mind if I handle this one? Because this is one that I think I do very well. Yes, you may handle this one. Go for it. And you do it very well. You do, absolutely, which is a good thing. <laughs> we laugh about this. Okay, honest and direct dialogue. I think it's really important to deliver feedback in a way that's constructive, kind, and direct right? But that direct is as important as the constructive and kind, because sometimes um, we have people talk to us, they give us input, but they don't really, they kind of dance around the issue, which denies us the opportunity to improve. So again, we want to have something constructive, not something vague, like be a nicer person. We want it to be kind. We don't, you know, an unkind way would be to say that's mean, and we want it to be direct but they're not going to avoid difficult conversations or constructive feedback. Elizabeth, any thoughts? I think the other piece to that is with the honest feedback, um, knowing that you don't, the, the challenging thing about feedback sometimes is it can feel hurtful, but if it's done in an honest way, it isn't meant to hurt you. It's actually meant to help you. Um, and so it's one of those, again, it's one of those really tricky things um, around the, the radical candor piece. And I, I think the other thing with honest feedback is that sometimes as people with disabilities, we don't get it. I'll, I'll be honest. I know I've been in this situation myself where people don't want to hurt our feelings, so they just don't tell us. But we need to know. Um, I've had many situations where I'm glad I've been told. I don't mind sharing that um, when Lisa and I first started training together, I had a background up. And it wasn't a background that was bad, but it maybe wasn't the most complimentary for training. And she was kind enough to share that with me and I fixed it. But if no one had told me, I would have gone on just using this virtual background, which again, wasn't bad, but it was it was more of a casual background, not something you'd want up for training. So it is meant to help you. And I, I think especially as somebody with a disability, um, I haven't always benefited from that because people are nervous. They don't want to offend us. I think that's so true. And I think there's this um, also this, hierarchy of, you know, low or tyranny of low expectations. So I think a lot of people go, oh, Elizabeth's blind. That's great. She has a background. Good for her. Instead of, you know, <laughs> recognizing that that would be valuable for you to be able to know exactly because somebody has put a bad alt text description in there. So you can't tell what it is. And, you know, we don't want to be um, funneled into those corners where we get meaningless and unhelpful or lack of feedback that holds us back. So um, I encourage you to embrace this, the model that Elizabeth and I really like. Now it's easier when you come from a position of power and recognizing that, but it's called radical candor. It's a, 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 an approach by Kim Scott, who taught at Apple University, worked for Google, did a couple hundred million dollar business, I think. 
um, but it's, you know, provide direct feedback that is also kind. So that's kind of the, the model. So if you're interested, we can put a link into the chat in a moment, but I, I think in particular for people with disabilities, it can be asking for clear and constructive, honest feedback that helps us move forward. That's why we have a mentor. If we were doing it perfectly, we wouldn't need the mentor in the first place. Genevieve. Thanks. I actually find this one really, really prevalent right now is because everybody is really, really trying to be careful and trying to be mindful of the language that we're using and everything else. Um, you know, from relevance from from previous conversations I had, I'd rather have people say, you know what, Jen, I really love this. Here's where an area that I noticed. Can you tell me more about what happened here? And let me let you know, I want to let you know how that actually I perceived that situation. So that way they're not necessarily telling me what I did wrong and how awful it was, yes. but they're giving me an opportunity to invite me in to have a conversation. And I love that. And I love the fact that you guys are mentioning this because as a mentor, I want to invite that with those that I support. Absolutely. I think it's um, it's so important. And again, you know, I, I think of this morning, the kindness is very, very important as well, because we're also in a time period or a point in time where people are angry and frustrated for a whole bunch of reasons, the economy, you know, the, the, the pandemic, housing costs if you're in Toronto, you know, credentialism if you're in school where you need more and more credentials to do the same job. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it can be kind of an ugly place to be working and having conversations in. So that kindness piece is, is critical, but so is the honesty. Which leads me to that next point right when yeah. you are having a conversation it's building that rapport first obviously you're not going to start throwing in some constructive without even knowing who you are actually working with but building that rapport so you can say listen i what i'd like to talk about um with you next is going is a sensitive area for both of us and i'd like to invite us to kind of find a space that we can have that honest conversation once you get in that kind of say okay yeah i'm ready then be able to have that say listen it's not going to be easy hearing this from me, but I really thought that this would be important for us to talk about. And again, like you said, direct, kind, but direct, right? Getting to the crux of it. I think too much now we're, we're, we're avoiding conversations because, well, I don't want to hurt that person's feelings or I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to sound too critical or whatever the case may be why you avoid having the conversation, have that conversation. You do not know what that impact can do to other if you don't. I, I absolutely, and again, you know, we're, I know we're talking about this, we're delving into it. I think it's a critical piece. I'm just going to move the slide back again to, to talk about that because in my experience working with employers, soft skills and a deficit of soft skills is why people lose their job. So you can have a mentor that tells you you need these educational qualifications, they can introduce you, they can do that. But if they don't tell you where your soft skills, which typically we learn what the soft skills in the work environment are in our first job. So if you've had a late start or you haven't had a chance to have a full-time job, you probably have some skills deficits in this area. And you need to hear it from your mentor. You don't wanna be hearing it from your boss. So this can be a really great place to use a mentor for. I was speaking this morning with a young man I'm coaching and being a mentor too. And, you know, I said, um, I, I, I think that you need to work on some of your soft skills. And it was like, no, 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 I don't. And it's like, yeah. And we had this really tough conversation where I have to give concrete examples to show why that's important. Because I think often we focus on the hard skills. So my mentor is going to tell me what qualifications I need. But equally important are those soft skills that we often don't talk about. Elizabeth, do you have anything you want to add to that? I love what Alan said in the chat about the fact that uh, you can reciprocate. You can also offer um, that radical candor to your mentors. And I think, you know, the other piece around soft skills that's so important is 
they're not something that we can sort of learn in the same way as a technical skill, right? So it's harder for us to know if we have them. So for example, I'll, I, I can speak comfortably about myself. I don't always know if I'm, I'm looking at somebody. And sometimes that's just due to the fact that I don't know where they are because I can't see them. Um, and other times it's just, I forget because it's not important to me. So I've had to be very clear with people that are my mentors. This is something I'm actively working on. Could you coach me? If you see me not looking in the right direction, just, just remind me. Or um, I'm a person that's always on the move and so I tend to fidget, but that could be distracting to people, right? So again, being knowing where my skill deficits were and are and being able to communicate that to my mentors to say, if you're noticing this, please tell me. I won't be offended. I want to improve because I think that helps people have those honest conversations if we can sort of have an understanding of where we might be lacking a little bit and then sharing that with our mentors and people around that we trust to help us sort of bridge those gaps. Absolutely. And again, this is where, and when we want this to be a two-way conversation, because this has come up a lot, you are looking to the mentors for, you have reached out to them for a reason. So the odds are that they're going to be more of an information pathway to you than it being back. So, you know, while I want you all to give your mentors feedback on what they can do more effectively, this isn't a mentorship for them to learn how to be a mentor. <laughs> this is a relationship where you're trying to get skills and um, feedback and direction on where you want to go. Okay, how do we find a mentor, Elizabeth? A couple of different places, past or present educational experiences or workplaces. So maybe there's a professor that you've had or that you have that you wanna reach out to. Somebody somebody mentioned this, bosses are, are great, past bosses, um, colleagues, people with whom you volunteered, trusted family friends. So I know we said earlier mentors aren't friends, but if you have a trusted family friend that's in an industry you wanna get into, certainly you can, you can reach out. Although sometimes it can be a little bit, um, the dynamics can shift a little bit when someone's a friend and a mentor. Um, having been in a position where I've been both, it can be a little bit tricky to know where to draw those boundaries. Volunteer work. So, you know, everybody's had to do volunteer work, I'm sure, at some point through student clubs or um, just in the community boards you're on. I have a mentor that um, is a board member on one of the boards I sit on industry events. So that's like your networking events could be a discoverability event, uh, could be an event through your school career center, maybe you meet somebody. Um, and community mental health agencies, amazing resource. That's fantastic. Um, because then you're talking about somebody who's a peer, they've had that experiential knowledge of living with a mental health disability. That's fantastic. Networking or LinkedIn. So connecting with folks on LinkedIn, um, although you kind of want to do your research and be mindful about how you're connecting, and I, I probably wouldn't ask them right off the bat. I might do an informational interview and a coffee chat and get to know them a bit before jumping into asking them to be a mentor. 10,000 Coffees. I love this one. I've actually done this. So this is actually uh, a website. You can connect with somebody in your industry and you go for a coffee and talk. So it's that's exactly what it is. It's 10,000 Coffees. It just connects people that are looking for guidance or feedback in a specific industry industry with with people that work in that industry now i'm gonna on these last two points because i do think they're excellent places to find mentors meeting with someone twice doesn't make them your mentor it's a more of a formalized relationship so to elizabeth's point just if somebody agrees to meet with you to um you know for even let's say four times in a month and you haven't explicitly asked them to be a mentor that's just networking so, you know, that's that's great. And it can lead to a mentorship, but it's a formal request. So you can't call someone a mentor if you've gone out for coffee with them twice. So you do want to formalize the, the process. And as Alan said, there are some workplaces that have mentorship programs and it, that can be very, very helpful. So, you know, uh, there's lots of different places in terms of the family and friends. I think more of like, perhaps maybe now I'm older and I have younger kids, but sometimes I get asked by my kids' friends to be a mentor. So you can look for maybe, a, you know, people that again um, are, you know, trusted and ask them, but you know, they should, you should have a pretty good idea of what the ask is for, because as Genevieve said, Mentors aren't always, you know, it's not cut out for everybody. Now, we've said a couple times you can have more than one mentor. And that if you do, 
they'll have different functions. The real, the, the great benefit of this is that you can get diverse perspectives. So you can get it on the hard skill side or how to break into my industry, but you might get also, well, here's the challenges as a person with a disability that I've faced and some things you wanna think about before they arise for you know the mentee. You can also have personal and professional mentors. So you could have one for your personal life, one for your professional life, one with a disability for your personal life. I mean, it's all over. So you can have as many as you want. You just want to be able to have meaningful relationships that work for both of you. So if all you're doing is spending your time with mentors, you've got too many. Um, but they can be a great tool to have a couple. And, you know, you meet once a month. Elizabeth, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think for me, just kind of thinking about the mentors with and without disabilities, having a mentor with a disability has really helped me to sort of unpack and understand some of the barriers specific to disability in my field. So I'm going to speak mostly about academe because that's what I'm in. So I'm part of a couple of Facebook groups. I have mentors that are further along in their academic journey who have disabilities. So we can talk about some of those pain points and how they resolve them. Or how did you go to a conference as somebody with a disability? And what accommodations did you ask for? And did you reach out to funding agencies to help? you cover those costs and having those really difficult but also um, very nuanced conversations that probably someone without a disability might not be able to answer because they haven't had to think about it in the same way and that's just that's not good or bad it just is and then having mentors in my field or in my um, area of study who don't necessarily have disabilities so in my case my supervisor my thesis advisor is a mentor now that doesn't necessarily have to be the case and it isn't always the case and some advisors actually don't want to be mentors um, but in my case my supervisor is very happy to mentor students um, and does a fantastic job at it so they can do more of that mentoring around here's how you first do that publication that you've wanted to get off the ground or here's how you go to that first conference and speak to this particular audience in a way that they're going to find palatable or here's how you write a shirk application so those are very technical to my field and something that somebody who's been through those things can talk about. So they're they're very different, and I think that they're both very valuable and serve different functions. And uh, I noticed in the co a comment something came up about um, some people in 10,000 Coffees not willing to continue the relationship. That's very common. We're actually going to address that. So you shouldn't have seen just because you want someone to be their mentor that they're going to be able to do that. Okay, so some other considerations is do they have experience, obviously, in your industry and in the type of company that you want to be in and the type of role? You should conduct online research. Check that they communicate respectively or respectfully, and are they well respected in their field? Check what the LinkedIn connections and recommendations say. So if it's very bland, oh yeah, I enjoyed working with Elizabeth, that's not a very good LinkedIn recommendation. Okay, it means somebody maybe didn't feel like they knew that person well enough to give some details or that there maybe wasn't a, an incredibly positive outcome. So check those LinkedIn connections and, you know, think about, well, why don't they have better, stronger recommendations? Now, be patient because not everyone will say yes. That's really, really critical. Okay, some people may have other things going on in their lives. All right, they may be trying to master a job on their own right now. They may have family, familial, familial obligations that you don't know about. They may be mentally exhausted from working remotely. They may already be a mentor to someone else and they're not gonna explain all of that because of confidentiality. So if they say no, thank them, but you know, don't take it as a personal rejection. You shouldn't really reach out to ask someone to be a mentor, I think, until you've met with them a couple times. You're going to consistently build a relationship with people over time. So it's a natural outcome of that. So because of that, you have to be on your best behavior at all time. And thank people, regardless of whether it was a positive or negative outcome. Elizabeth, you know, I know you and I, you were the one who said, you know, brought up this whole blue box that's on the screen with the be patient. Mm -hmm. Not everybody will say yes. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of not saying yes doesn't mean it's a no because they don't want to. It might not be the right time. So especially in a pandemic where folks are juggling a lot more responsibilities and, and life 
life circumstances than we normally are. No isn't, oh, I don't want to be a mentor to that person. It's, I just can't fit another thing on my plate. Um, and that's really important to think about. And so if they say no, what I might say is, is it okay if I follow up with you in a, in a couple of months? Would, would that be okay? Or would you, would you feel like perhaps I'm not the right fit for a mentoring relationship? And that's okay too, because they may not want to mentor you simply because they're not in your industry and they might not have anything to offer. So no isn't bad. It's just you really want to kind of dig a little bit deeper. So you can ask, do you, you know, is it okay if I follow up? And if they say no, that's fine too. It, it might just be they're not, a, they're not a good fit. And you can say, is there anybody you'd recommend I reach out to? So I, you know, I'm hearing that this might not be a, a, a good fit. Do you have any suggestions of folks I can read out, reach out to? Yes, Carly Fox over at Needs, they're fantastic when it comes to social media. Why don't you give them a try? Can't promise that they'll be able to help, but then you've got it's another contact. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, um, that said, the ask, identify a potential mentor, follow them on their social media. That's the easiest, especially in the, this virtual world. Okay, because you should know what they're saying and what they're talking about and what their expertise is. So the way to do that is to look at articles they've read or posted if they're in academia, follow a blog if they have one, looked at their LinkedIn or social media. Ask for a short initial meeting. And once you've had that, you need to think about, do I want to pursue this? Does this meet with my goals? You should always follow up by thanking them for meeting with you. And then if you want to meet again, you ask at that point. I found our first meeting very informative. I'm wondering if in two weeks we could follow up with a second meeting. So then you meet again. You still don't have the expectation. You're not going to jump right in. You know, hey, will you be my mentor? Ask them for feedback. I've really found this productive. You know, how have you found this? You know, and then regardless of what they say, thank them and ask for a more formal mentorship relationship at that point, depending on what they've said. Well, you know, actually I've enjoyed meeting with you, Elizabeth, but I do have some time crunches. So, you know, you're not gonna ask them because they've kind of indicated to you. So you can see this isn't a, oh, I found someone on LinkedIn. Will you be my mentor? It's a process. Preparation, key, the key to success, logistics. Think about what, how are we gonna communicate via email, over the telephone, how often, how long are meetings gonna be? Where are we gonna meet? Is it virtual, is it a cafe? You need to identify your short-term and your long-term goals. And they need to be specific. Use that SMART acronym, specific, measurable, actionable, results-oriented and time-bound, okay? So you can't say, I want to improve my career. What does that look like to you? In what time frame? Does that mean get a raise? Right? Um, it, it might be um, I'm looking to, um, you know, get a promotion within one year from my boss. You know, be very specific. Outline the rules and expectations. Create an agenda. Create a list of questions before you go in and take notes. This is all really important. It shows them that you're serious. Now, in that initial meeting, Elizabeth, what are some of the questions we might ask someone? Yeah, just before we get to those, I, I just want to flag really quickly taking notes. For some of us that use adaptive devices, it can sometimes look like we're on our phone or our iPad mm -hmm. when we're actually trying to take notes. And so what I've started to do in all of my meetings is say, you might see me picking up my phone. I just want you to know I'm present. What I'm doing is I'm actually dictating some notes. And so I want you to know I'm here and I'm listening. But if you see the phone, please know why. Because unfortunately, people do equate that with being rude and not listening. So I just wanted to flag that really quickly. That was a lesson I had to learn. Oh, and as a private person, I like this. Alan says, as a private person uh, who may not be active on social media, that doesn't mean that somebody would be a bad mentor or doesn't know what they're doing. They may just be a private person. That is an excellent point. There's Absolutely. more than one way to connect with people. Thank you so much, Alan. So questions to consider. And these are just some, some options. How did you get started in your career? Right? So thinking, thinking about where did that person maybe go to school? What skills did they need? How did they manage and expand their network? both virtual and in person. What advice would you give someone starting in this field? So it's kind of back to what Lisa and I were saying earlier about what do you wish you'd known then that you know now kind of thing. So what advice would you give somebody? What potential barriers 
might I encounter getting into this field? And that doesn't necessarily mean disability barriers, although it might. It could just be, well, actually, um, there's not a lot of hiring right now for uh, primary teachers in, in this town or city or district. So you're, you're going to have to be on the supply list for a while. That's, that's a, just an example, right? But barriers can be disability or not disability. How have you dealt with challenges at work related to your disability? And if they don't have a disability, you might say something like, well, how, have, how do you think, what, what are some challenges you think I might encounter around accessibility in this field, right? Because sometimes people can kind of, um, once they get to know you a bit, help you brainstorm that. How did you develop? and then any type of skill. So how did you develop your public speaking skills, Lisa? Did you take Toastmasters? Did you take a specific course through continuing education? What books did you read? Absolutely. So those are just to get you started, um, some guidelines, and then we have to wrap up. Make a commitment generally, you know, a year, six months at the minimum. It needs to have time to, for to evolve for both of you. Build that trusting and respectful relationship agree on expectations and milestones, and meet or communicate with enough regularity to develop a strong relationship. So making a commitment of a year and you're gonna meet every six months is not a great idea. So it needs to be regular enough for both of you to benefit from, to structure, to be able to get some input and feedback, but not too much that um, that doesn't work for you. So that's it for us. I know that Carly has some things she wants to. Feel free to reach out to either Elizabeth or myself with any questions. Elizabeth, would you like to, and thank you all for being such an attentive audience. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat and I'm going to let Elizabeth wrap up here for us. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll throw our emails in the chat. I'll throw my website in the chat. Um, and of course the needs website as well. Feel free to reach out to us. And I, you know, I think one thing I would say is that mentorship is, it's something that's always evolving, right? It's uh, and it's a really, like we talked about today, it's going to be different for everybody. And this is a topic I'm passionate about because of the great mentors I've had and the opportunities I've had to be a mentor. You can be a mentor and a mentee at the same time. Um, so don't, don't think that if you're receiving mentorship, you can't also give it back. Um, so thanks so much to the needs team and Carly, Frank, uh, Unique, Aaliyah, and everyone else for having Lisa and myself here today. And uh, thank you for listening and all your participation. It was great. All right, before everyone starts logging out, I promise this will be worth your time. Please don't log out. Okay, uh, so we do have a next event coming up April 13th in two weeks. It is an interactive workshop on virtual accessibility, uh, mainly around social media, websites, and uh, virtual documents, which is really exciting. So I will drop a link to the registration in the chat box while talking to you. Let's see how well I can multitask. And then another really exciting thing we have coming out is that the 2022 NEED Student Awards Program and Accessibility Resilience Program uh, applications are now open. We are giving out $3,000 awards to 42 students through our NEED Student Awards Program and up to 174 reimbursements of up to $5,000 through our Accessibility Resilience Program. So I will drop those application links in the chat. Could not recommend applying more. Excellent, excellent time. Uh, finally, we are seeking panelists for our upcoming spring events. Uh, spots are available for our attendance service, attendance services panel, graduate studies panel, and virtual access for all panel. So for more information, there will be a link to a media release in the chat. And for those interested, uh, send your resume my way over to me at carly.foxadmeans.ca. And as our social media manager, I am obliged to promote our social medias. Uh, here you'll find the latest updates on events, awards, projects, you name it. We also just launched two Facebook groups for the Mindings community, uh, one just for disabled students and one open to everyone. So thank you again so much. And thank you so much to Lisa and Elizabeth. We always love having you two on. Yeah, and Frank, you're good to stop recording.